thank you for joining the graduate school information session. Um, our panelists today are Joy Ghosh, uh, Associate Professor of Statistics and Actuarial Science at the University of Iowa, Jalen Lee, Principal Statistician at um, UC Irvine, Shi Yu Shu, who's a PhD student at, um, in biostats at uh, George Washington University, and Jessica George, who should be joining us, um, who's in the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Southern California. Um, so yeah, I'll give the panelists a chance to introduce themselves. Yes, I can go first. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Jalen Lee. Uh, I'm a principal statistician at the Institute for Clinical and Translational Science. Uh, it's a department in UC Irvine. Uh, most of my work involves consulting with researchers and helping them uh, write grants, analyze their data, um, submit manuscripts, things of that nature. Um, and I attended uh, UCI for my PhD in statistics. I can go next. So I'm Joey Ghosh. I'm an associate professor of statistics, actually. Our department is statistics and actuarial science, but I am part of the statistics faculty um, at the University of Iowa. And I did my um, bachelor's in statistics from India, my master's and PhD in statistics from Duke, same as Monica's. And um, then I did a two-year postdoc in biostatistics at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And since then, I have been here. And um, I have uh, been the director of graduate studies here. And uh, I was the chair of the admissions committee, graduate admissions committee. So I have some experience with that. And uh, glad to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, so I will go next. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is uh, Shu Yushu, and you can just call me Richard. I'm a third-year PhD student at George Washington University. I'm in the de Department of uh, Statistics, and I'm currently working on some uh, clinical trial methodologies. And yeah, so for my undergrad, I did my undergrad at Vassar College. It's a liberal arts college in upstate New York. And uh, I double major in math and econ, and later then I went to a master program uh, about uh, applied statistics statistics at Carnegie Mellon University. And then the COVID hit. So I worked for a year at a healthcare company and think doing something more related to the health domain is, is cool. So I applied for a PhD program in bio statistics. And here I am, here I am, yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Our fourth panelist just joined us, um, Jessica George. Would um, you mind giving a brief introduction of yourself? Thank you. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jessica George. Um, I'm currently in my first year as a PhD student um, studying biostatistics at USC. Um, before this, um, I was at UC Irvine and SoCal um, studying data science. Um, and after that, um, I worked for a couple of years at a pharmaceutical company called Abzi. Um, I was a data scientist there, um, but I slowly kind of shifted more into biostatistics there, but I slowly realized that a bachelor's degree wouldn't cut it. Um, so that's what brought me here today and, and at grad school at USC. Nice to meet everybody and thank you for having me. Thank you um, for the introductions. Uh, for everyone else watching, we ask if you have any questions to put them in the Q&A feature um, and we'll ask them for you. But we can start off. I, I think all of the panelists have shared a little bit about their academic journey uh, to get to where they are now. But we're kind of wondering if um, there's anything that more that you share that you could share about your academic trajectory that you think would be important to those that are with us today. and. Um, share whether how you are happy with what you're doing now um, and what aspects of your work you enjoy. Thank you. All right, I can say a little. 
So uh, when I went for PhD, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to be in academics or uh, industry. And I actually, I, I was thinking of going to industry. So I did an internship uh, at um, a pharmaceutical company. And I think that made me realize that I like academics more. So I, I enjoy the freedom um, of working on whatever I'm interested in, which is not going to be so much the case when you're in industry. So, um, but I still was undecided. And uh, some people told me to uh, do a postdoc after that. So it kind of helps you um, see more that are you liking this? It's a more postdoc is more independent than PhD. So that kind of made me realize, yes, this is the direction I want to go in. Um, I enjoy teaching, I enjoy research, and uh, I enjoy the freedom. So, so I'm, I'm happy uh, to be here. That's um, all for now. Um, I can kind of piggyback off that a bit. Um, I think you you touched on a really important point, which that, um, or at least where I also find myself in this kind of like iterative process, um, where you slowly inch closer um, and find out exactly what you're passionate about um, with the work. Um, and for me, you know, what that looks like was um, starting more broadly in data science, which is really kind of marrying the concepts um, from computer science and statistics. Um, and I really loved, um, you know, my job um, working at ASI as a data scientist. It was, um, you know, working with a lot of um, more like neural network approaches and building kind of predictive models. Um, but, you know, that brought me to working with a lot of statisticians. And I slowly realized that, um, you know, inference modeling or modeling for inference is actually what I enjoyed more. Um, but there was a big gap in my knowledge. Um, so that really pushed me, you know, to apply for grad school. Um, and kind of get back into the swing of school to really refine my skills and master the material. Um, so I think the biggest piece of advice as far as like planning your trajectory, and at least I'm using that for, for myself, um, is to, yeah, just kind of eat away um, at the things that you like um, about your work, um, because it could lead you to, you know, something more niche, um, where there's a need for that work, um, and then you're also really passionate about it. Um, you know, for me, I feel like right now I'm in the middle of this grind. I'm in a lot of, you know, the core, like foundational statistics classes. It's a little bit dry. It's a little bit hard to comprehend at times. Um, but I'm motivated by the fact that the years following that are going to be filled with research that I really enjoy with clinical trials. Um, so that's really what's motivating me um, to get there. Um, so I think, yeah, just being able to look ahead and know that you're getting to the areas that of where you want to be, um, that's always what's going to push you to excel um, with where you currently are. Uh, I think for me, it's really important to figure out what you want. So when I graduated from uh, my bachelor degree, I I only took a few statistics courses, and I'm not really sure if uh, grad school is for me, and that's why I applied for some more like applied statistics or data science master programs. And then it's through that work experience, I realized that I need a PhD degree to make contributions on a higher level. And that's why I continued to my PhD education. And I think that's very important if you really figure out why you need to do that PhD program, because it's a huge investment, both in time and in other things. And yeah, I think because I have some friends that they really, the PhD is somewhat a, a miserable part of their life so yeah I think once you figure it out it's you, you can be happier and that's really important yeah yeah I'll I'll piggyback off of that um and say um it, it's really good to identify exactly what you want to accomplish with your PhD and that um you know it's 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 a long time that you're dedicating towards uh the, a, a research project and so if it's not something you're clearly passionate about. It's it's really going to eat at you. Um, and so if you have something at the end of the day that you want to accomplish with your PhD, and for me, that's um, I really get out a lot out of contributing to the research projects and the research process. 
And that's not something that is typically done, um, you know, after a bachelor's degree at like a data science level. It's more like someone asks a question. It's like, okay, I'll run the standard models and do the thing. Uh, but I really get out a lot of, um, you know, uh, speaking with the who I'm consulting with or who I'm talking to with the with my collaborators and saying, okay, what do we want to know at the end of the day? How do we design the the study to accomplish that? What's the model, the best model that we can fit for that? Um, I really get out a lot of that. And so, in order to do more of that, you need a PhD. And so that's what really drove me through my entire process. Thank you for sharing. And if nobody from the audience has another question yet, um, I could ask a question uh, in that how, what are the most important parts of an application? What should applicants focus on the most? And what might graduate school selection committees be looking for in an application? I think it depends from um, like where you're applying to. So <clears throat> here I know that, um, so so we expect, we I think their GRE is kind of optional now at many places, but we still require it. And here, um, most of the importance is given on the, the math part of it, not the verbal. So um, that I know here, but I know for other places where, again, it depends on what place is it. If everyone has close to a full score on the math GRE, then they might look at the verbal just to see how hard working you are. So um, so, so the math GRE getting, um, uh, not the math uh, special math GRE, but in the math part of the quantitative part of the GRE, I think is you really, need to score well there and if you don't for some reason uh, the first time you probably want to take it a second time to improve it and the other things we look at here are um, if you have taken some math stat courses that that counts as um, positive uh, we expect calculus linear algebra computing a regression course. And uh, if you have taken a real analysis course, that's that's a positive. So kind of getting good grades on in those obviously would help. And we also um, try to see, so not just academics, if one if a student has done other things, it's um it it's counted in a positive way that you're um you're well grounded you you can handle different things like someone was saying that it can be um it can be challenging sometimes uh, the phd or masters years because it's a lot of um, um it it can get very uh, stressful at some time so so if you if you have other interests those kind of help uh, apart from academics so I think, and of course, letters uh, are important. You you definitely want to ask uh, people who you think will write a good letter from you uh, for you, which um, would be uh, usually someone uh, whose course um, is is in which you did well. So, or you probably you you can even ask. I think whether they could write a strong letter for you. Um, to make sure that that's solid. And last, I guess, is a statement uh, needs to be very well written. Uh, it's good if you can ask someone to read it, polished, no typos, um, because that's the only part they will see before if they have a Zoom interview. Before that, that's that's what they're going to <clears throat> use to screen. So I think that's, that's all I can think of now. Uh, I'll say another component um, is a maybe not necessarily uh, super uh, either precise or concise research direction, but like a, a strong indication that you are passionate about research and it's something that you want to do uh, because a PhD is a research degree. You're going to be contributing a new body of work to the field that hasn't been done before. Um, so 
either past indications that you've done that. So like an undergrad research experience goes a very long way, I'll say. Um, but barring that, if there is some portion of the field that you're very passionate about and you can lay out exactly what you want to contribute and what you want to study as part of that, um, I would say that goes a very long way as well. Um, and part of getting that can be just like talking to your professors and seeing what they're working on. What are some questions that they have about what their focus is? Um, and if that's interesting to you, then, you know, you can talk to them and sort of like get those ideas and put those in your research statement uh, because they, they, they do read those and, and that can go a long way. Uh, I just want to add on that. So you might also want to show in your personal statement that you have done some research about the department, about the professors. Like, yeah, you, you should know like what fields those professors are working on and, and yes, yeah, show some interest. And yeah, just maybe a paragraph or two to discuss about those things. I think that could also help. And I'll say that could also go towards like picking what university you want to study at. Um, where you're at doesn't typically matter too much, I'll say, for grad school. It's mostly like your advisor who you're working with that is like the biggest influence on your experience um, in your program. So if you have like a really good match with your PhD advisor, it can be a pretty great experience. And then I've also seen not so good matches where um, it, it doesn't go so well. Um, so really like research, like, what those professors do, what they're working on, because if your fields co uh, collide um, in a positive way, then you're going to have a good time. Um, and so that's that's the experience we want. Um, I think I agree with everything that has been said. Um, and just to like emphasize a little bit extra, um, I think a lot of what they want to see when you're applying, um, and, and Jalen, you touched on this a bit, is that this is this is a long commitment, um, and they want to know that you're committed for that full time. Um, so you definitely want to, and there's opportunity to do that in your personal statement. You know, there's opportunity to to mention that in the interviews. Um, you really want to make it known um, to the admissions board that you are committed to this program and that you will stay committed the whole time that you are there. Um, and if, if you are able to get that message across, that goes a long way um, in enhancing, um, you know, the likelihood of getting in and you being able to excel there. Thank you. Um, if no one else has anything to add, I'll jump into another question related to the application process. It's kind of been mentioned a couple of times, but for someone with um, experience in industry going um, before applying to their PhD program or someone considering um, going to industry before considering a PhD? Do you have any advice for them um, about either choosing those two paths or um, then per pursuing an application to a PhD program post-industry? Um, so, I mean, based on the, uh, based on my experience, um, I finished my undergrad studies in data science and, you know, I was a first generation student. I didn't really have a lot of, um, you know, uh, background information to pull from um, as to, you know, what I would want to do next. Um, so that led me and along with the help from a professor um, to land a job in industry. And I would say that I spent three years there and that time was crucial. Um, to mapping out um, the years following um, that position. Um, I had the opportunity during my last year um, to work under statisticians, so it was a, a much more statistically driven role than um, your traditional or classic data science role. Um, and that really like drilled in the fact that I wanted to be a statistician as opposed to just a data scientist, but realistically, you know, the, the tools and skills that you learn from statistics all apply to data science as well. So it would strengthen, um, you know, a position in more related to the data science industry if I chose that route um, later on. But yeah, I would say if you're not sure about your next step, um, you know, I feel like a lot of times, of course, you want to lend on the people who have already walked 
those steps. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you should just mimic um, what they do just based on what they, they said, right? Um, so I think the biggest thing is getting your own experience and being using that experience to answer the question yourself. Um, you know, and, and at least I can definitely say 100% that that worked for me. Um, so I would say, yeah, if you're not sure, um, I would definitely rely heavily on the resources that you've built up so far um, to plan your next step. Um, and that should hopefully either be a stepping stone to something better, or maybe you'll realize you're exactly where you're supposed to be and you can stay there for even longer. Yeah, I'll say it's a, it's really important to know what you want to get out of a PhD um, because otherwise, right, you're, you're not making a lot of money as a PhD student, especially as compared to a data scientist in industry uh, who may be working for a tech company and is in a pretty swanky office and whatnot. Um, you are very underpaid uh, for your skill set. And so if you don't have a well-defined light at the end of the tunnel of the thing that you want to do uh, after you get your PhD, whether that's going to academia and being a professor, whether that's uh, a more research-focused role, working in like a national lab or working for a government job doing research. Um, if that's not a thing that you know you want to do at the end of the day, um, then I would sort of advise to like go towards industry and like, uh, hey, apply your skills as you know them. And then once you know what you want to learn or do, um, with this research degree, then I would say, hey, apply to grad school. Um, that would be my advice, because otherwise it will be a long and not very fun time for you. Yeah, I think if you are really not sure about whether you want to continue with a master, uh, like graduate education or like uh, extra, job, uh, extra working experience, uh, you can. So, so, so what I really regret is that I didn't try enough things during my undergraduate time. Like you can do some summer internships. I know right now there are many pharma companies that they would offer like summer internships for bachelor students. And that's a very good opportunity. Or you can do some like side projects with your professors, do some st statistical projects. So you can apply your theories to real world problems. And I think that's very important. And through that experience, you would, you would understand if like a research life is for you or not. So there, you can also do masters, uh, which is more course-based, not necessarily research for which some students we have who come back from industry and they're actually um, very focused, um, more mature, I would say. So, uh, so the reason why they come back uh, is that if you don't have a master's, often you, you, you have less control over things that you can do. And so you, you just to do more interesting things, you, you need both the skills and the degree. So that would be an option. You, you don't necessarily have to do a PhD. And if depending on uh, which stage of career you are, there's also something called U2G, where your fifth year, I think your fourth year counts as a master's first year. And so in five years, you can get a master's and an undergrad degree, which you can here in both statistics and data science. And then you can again decide what you want to do after that. So we we definitely have students who have a bachelor's in math or stat who went to industry and then they are are back here, but they only want to do a master's. Sometimes they have um, kind of other um, restrictions, uh, so two body problems for which they can't commit to a PhD. We also had students who were kind of burnt out uh, after master's, and they they just couldn't think that they would be able to focus on research for that long, but they went to industry and we had uh, one student who came back um who who is doing a phd and who's almost uh, finished it so in fact um so we uh, to some students who uh, we we would really like to have as phd students we encourage them and we uh, encourage them 
to contact us again if they change their mind after working in the industry. And some of them go, go back to industry after that, and some may uh, want to have an academic job. So it's um, so it's kind of based on, um, again, what you think you like, try it. And uh, if you if that doesn't work, you, your options are still open. Thank you for sharing. Um, before I move into the next question, I just want to acknowledge the sponsors of this event. Um, thank you to the American Statistical Association, the Consortium for the Advancement of Undergraduate Statistics Education, as well as the ASA section on statistics and data science education. If nobody um, in the audience has any questions, I'll ask another question. Um, Richard, you mentioned um, doing summer internships and research with professors. Um, I was wondering if any, um, if you have any more thoughts or any of the other panelists have more thoughts on what kinds of summer opportunities or research opportunities students, undergraduate students should look for if they're interested in pursuing um, a master's or a PhD after graduation. I'll say a, a big and easy one is the NSS sponsored program, the REUs, Research Experience for Undergrads. Um, they have like a whole bunch of uh, sites at universities all over the US um, and uh, you apply for those. You have like a sponsoring professor who serves as your um, research mentor and you have like a couple of weeks uh, to um, essentially get out like a research project in like eight to 10 weeks or so. It's like a really cool bite-sized way to sort of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, see what a PhD would be like in like a mini summer camp type thing. It's really cool. Um, I did that my uh, junior year of undergrad and that's what sort of um, turned me on to research and showed me that that's a thing that I enjoyed. Um, and then from the work in that ended up being like my first publication, like my senior year. Um, so there's like good work that can come out of that, um, which can really help when if you want to apply to grad school later on. I guess I'll, I'll say another one real quick is uh, if you're uh, cool to a professor and they're doing like cool and interesting things, uh, professors often have a lot more questions than they have bandwidth to work on. Um, and so they probably have like some smaller, uh, maybe like, like there's a method they want to implement, but they don't want to work on coding it up. And so they'll like throw you this paper and say, hey, uh, can you read this and then code this method up or do something like that? Um, or, hey, run these models on this data because I'm interested in the results, but I don't have time to do it myself. Um, and those are like small ways that you can get started on the research process and get uh, sort of involved into like an area and sort of show to yourself that that's like an area that you enjoy. Um, I found out very quickly I'm not into surgical research because uh, those papers are very graphic and they'll have like uh, like pictures of wounds and whatnot. And I'm a very squeamish person. And so I found out that that is not an area that I want to be in. Um, and so through those experiences, you can you can find that out about yourself. Yeah, I agree with you, Jalen. Um, some of my most like rewarding research before grad school um, I found through professors, um, one of which um, was during COVID. Um, obviously, there was an abundance of research that took off about COVID. Um, and um, at UC Irvine, um, one of my professors uh, just recruited me and another student um, to do research for you know a full academic quarter or a full semester. Um, and so that can be a really good way, um, again, just, you know, making use of the resources that are around you, um, like as Jalen said, like professors have a bunch of research that they want to do, but they don't have, you know, the, the pupils, um, available always to, to fill, um, that gap. Um, and similarly, um, another one of my research experiences, um, I was, uh, working with another professor from a separate university um, for my capstone project for my for undergrad. Um, and once we finished that project, she actually asked um, if I wanted to continue doing research. And I actually continued um, doing that research. I'm actually still doing it now. 
um, on the side. So um, you should just, I would just say, yeah, reaching out and kind of being able to um, form those connections while you're maybe working with a professor in class. Um, and then, you know, just um, work up some courage, then maybe just to ask about other research that they may be doing and then how you could be of help. Um, I think just, yeah, putting your best foot forward there um, is what makes the difference and can easily help you get started in research. And I think the other thing too is um, not even being so focused on what the research is about necessarily, because any experience, the research process generally is pretty standardized. Um, so any practice that you are getting will help later on with research that maybe you're more passionate about. Um, there's also, too, I was going to mention, um, there's a lot of resources online, like if you've never done, um, you know, writing, like academic writing before, um, Elsevier has like a great, um, it's just like eight part guide um, to kind of teach you how to write in that type of language. Um, so utilizing those tools in your free time also can, you know, help you be ahead of, you know, some other student who's not utilizing those tools. Yeah, I think it's always most convenient to reach out to your professors to know what projects are available. And the bonus is that through that working experience, you can also get a stronger recommendation letter. Maybe that's a bonus. And I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with what Jessica said. What the project is really about is not that important compared to the research experience. Because as a statistician, you're always playing in someone else's backyards. Like you are learning about some new subjects, new fields, and you need domain knowledge. And yeah, so so it's also a good learning experience. And yeah, ju just don't be afraid and you can try different projects. So when I applied for a PhD, I actually had no research experience because the place where I went to, uh, it, it was not an option. And so if that's the case, you can use um, examples. Like if you did any project for your class, for any of the classes, you can show that as your research experience. Uh, if you didn't individually work with anyone, so that can help. And um, I think it's more important also not just to not for uh, your to make your application stronger. It's also who helps you know whether you will like it or not, it, because it's very different from regular coursework. So I had no experience of that actually until I was in the program. But fortunately for me, I really enjoyed it. So which was so different from regular coursework, which is okay, but as, as some students said, uh, it's it's different from research. So um, yeah, so you, even if you don't have the experience, it, you can still um, talk about things, other things to kind of um, fill in for that. And when we look at applications, definitely if someone has a publication, that's that's quite something. But otherwise, if you don't have it, I think it doesn't uh, matter so much. If you, if you, if your case looks like you are a motivated student, your transcript is strong. We, the the prediction is that you you will be successful later. So so often it's it's motivation is very very important. So you want to show that even if you don't have the research experience. All right, thank you. If no one has anything else on that question, um, we have a question about the differences between biostatistics and statistics. So if you're willing to share why you chose one of those paths um, and what you may see as the advantages or disadvantages of those two options. Okay, I'll get things started. Um, so for me, at least, um, you know, since I was basically just applying um, this year um, for grad school, um, I did apply to both biostatistics and statistics programs. And um, I'm actually going to kind of shift the focus not to comparing the two, but I would say if you're looking to apply to grad school, I would focus actually on looking at the actual courses that you have to take. 
um, because that's really going to give you an indication of what the program is going to be like, whether the title is statistics or biostatistics. Um, at least at USC, um, one of the strengths that told me to choose, um, you know, their biostatistics program as opposed to a staff program at a different university was that um, for my second year, um, I get to choose a specialization and all the specializations are kind of catered to some type of area of, of bio in some way. So you have, um, there's four options. There's clinical trial design and analysis. There is um, environmental statistics. There is um, a more general biostatistics theory track, and then there's also a um, genome or genetics track. Um, so that was at least for me, um, knowing that I kind of was drawn to clinical trials already from my industry experience, that was a pro and a pro for choosing a biostat specific program. But like I said, it, when you're choosing um, a grad program and you know whether it's staff or bio staff, it really comes down to the courses and if those courses match up to you know the skills that you want to build out to support you later on in your career. Yeah, I guess I'll uh, piggyback off that to maybe like a bigger point in that. Uh, Statistics is like a very wide, wide field. Um, you could have collaborators who you're both doing statistics, you're both in the same statistics program, and you'll attend like one of their talks or like talk about like what they're working on. You have no idea what's going on, but you're both doing statistics. Um, and so I would just like think about like, what do I want to apply my methods to? What do I want to learn about? What do I want? What type of data do I want to work with? Um, and what type of advances do I want to make? I think that should be like the the driving key characteristic rather than whether it's called a statistics program or a biostatistics program. Um, and I, I think that could that could help a lot. Yeah, so in my opinion, it's actually up to you to to decide whether you want to go to a biostats program or a stats program, because uh, you you should know what's who's your audience and like what's what are the things you want to apply uh, what statistical methods to what data you want to apply your statistical methods to and i can only speak in the experience of as a biostatistician because your audience will be epidemiologists will be clinicians and will be many other uh, people related to biology, and they may not be really sophisticated in mathematics, and you will need to be a really good communicator, and you need to present your uh, statistical theory in a good way, in a presentable way, and I think that's a very important for biostatistics. So I would say, uh... In general, again, if not for every department, but in general, biostatistics is more application driven. Courses can be a little bit more applied than courses in statistics departments. For example, often traditionally statistics departments would have a probability theory course, a measure theoretic probability theory course, but biostatistics department may not necessarily have that. So whether you um, you want to do more applications-driven research or you want to do more theoretical research kind of can drive that. But of course, you can still have uh, people who are doing a lot of theoretical work in biostats department and people in stat departments who are doing more application-driven work. So uh, I actually, when I was uh, I was applying, I wanted to go to biostatistics because I like applications more and I consider myself as an applied statistician. But when I was uh, submitting my GRE score, I noticed that they require you uh, to have taken some courses in biology, uh, which I had not. And so I changed my mind at that point and I just applied to start departments. But later on, I found out that actually it doesn't matter that even if you don't uh, satisfy that requirement, they, they can still consider you. So um, so that kind of uh, changed my trajectory in some way, I would say. But um, I have been in the stat department and I did um, a postdoc 
in a biostat department. So there's a little bit of, um, it's a little different, the culture in biostatistics. You have to uh, collaborate a lot more. And um, so you, you may have to do, uh, work with uh, epidemiologists, doctors, and so it kind of also, and for some some of the work, you might have to do something that's um, that's not really related to your research, but trying to answer their questions, which is not um, necessarily very difficult, uh, but you may have to do many, many of those things because that's how, so biostatistics is often uh, funded more by grants than, so soft money, than by teaching. So we we don't necessarily need grants um, for a salary, but if you're in a biostat department and you're a faculty, you need grants. So 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 again, it's um, it's a little different. So if you like that kind of collaborative work, it's um, it's probably um, good to be there. Uh, whereas if you if you're kind of more uh, you like teaching more and you're kind of more. Uh, working on your own or with other collaborators from maybe other statisticians or not necessarily health related applications that might drive you to statistics more. Thank you. Um, I think we have one more time uh, time for one more question, quick question before we turn things over to the career panel. Um, you all have talked a little bit in the context of applications of doing research into um, the professors that work um, at the schools that you apply to and the research that they do. And I was wondering if you could briefly share how, what went into your decision process of picking an advisor and how you knew that that would be a good fit going in. Uh, I'll say mine was really easy in that the professor I was working with uh, was working with brain stuff and I thought brain stuff was cool. Um, and so I did my dissertation on brain stuff and that's why I picked him. Um, so I actually haven't chosen an advisor yet, um, mostly just because I'm in my first year and the focus is really kind of more on the classes if you don't, if you didn't go into the school kind of already with somebody in mind to work with. Um, but I would say so far, um, my process has been, um, you know, obviously looking at the faculty that are available in the school and kind of seeing um, which faculty members um, utilize methods that you're interested in, in um, also, you know, working on and learning about. Um, that's a good first start. Um, usually, I, I've seen at most um, schools as well, they usually will have some type of like um, recurring meeting um, where you get to hear from different faculty members and even hear maybe about uh, the students and what their research is about. Um, and so we have something like that weekly um, as well. It's like called our like bio staff seminar. Um, so I've heard also from a couple of faculty members about their work and that's also um, kind of show, even if you're sitting there and you don't understand necessarily what they're talking about, um, you, they usually um, get the message across about how this, how it can be used. Um, and that should kind of help you focus and, and um, you know, focus on the work and see if it's something that interests you. The other um, benefit of seeing the faculty members or students that work with a potential faculty member that you're interested in is that you get to see their mannerisms and how they present themselves. Um, which kind of lends to the point also of, of picking somebody who you get along with and can enjoy, you know, doing research with, because um, that's also very, very important. Um, yeah, so I would say, say both of those um, uh, are ways to um, kind of see who would be right for you. Um, and then at least for me, since I haven't chosen yet, um, my next step would be to, you know, get in contact with that faculty member you know, first see if they have space to potentially take on another student. Um, and then from there, of course, get to talking about the research and, and see where you can be of help. And there are plenty of opportunities usually where the faculty member will, will want, to, want to do some type of like trial run with you, um, where they may give you, you know, some simpler, for lack of other words, research, um, just to see if it's, it's something that, that you enjoy. Um, so yeah, that, that I would say those are the the steps to, to getting involved with, with the faculty member. 
Yeah, I think going and talking to faculty about what they're working on, if if they would be taking students, what kind of things they might work on, um, and maybe reading a little bit uh, about their publications. Everyone you, you can usually find um, on their web page or Google Scholar. Um, that that could help. One is um, whether your research interests align with the person, and the other definitely is personalities, because it's a long journey, and you you kind of want to uh, choose a person with whom you can easily get along. It's a comfortable relationship. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I don't want to take any of the time from the career panel, so I just want to quickly say thank you to the panelists for discussing um, giving advice on those applying to graduate school. Um, yeah, thank you for taking the time.